If you are joining us by phone, please put your phone on mute. For everyone else, I think you've seen, I've already put everyone else on mute. As with our previous events, a link to this recorded session will be sent out later to you by email. Feel free to share it with your friends and family. Watersheds Canada has asked if we would share your email addresses for those attending this evening. If you do not want your email address to go forward, then please just put a note or a comment in the chat function and I'll, uh, I'll, we'll honor that. As well, obviously, for those who may not uh, be able to respond for whatever reason, you can always um, go on their email list and then unsubscribe in the future. And I'm sure Chloe uh, will speak to that later. As with all of our winter speaker series, we're proud of comp to have partnered with Friends of the Salmon River. And more specifically, our appreciation goes out to Susan Moore, their president, and Stephanie Wright for their continued support, PR, and technical support for all of our events. Here's the lineup of speakers and topics for our winter speaker series or for both past and future. Remember, all events are free and open to everyone. Olivia's topic on May 18th is probably perfect timing for planning your springtime gardens. Before I hand off to our speakers, we would like to remind you that you can, you can join our growing association for just $10 per household per, per year. And there's the information. If, uh, if you can't write it down fast enough, just go to our website and you'll find it there. Or alternatively, you can join Friends of the Salmon River. I'd like to remind everyone that you do not have to be a member of either of our groups to take part in our online events or in-person events for that matter, whenever we are able to get started on those again, hopefully soon. As a reminder, if you have any questions or comments during the session, please use the Zoom chat function or type in your, to type in your questions or comments. And we will ask your questions at the end of both presentations. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Amanda Gray, who is a member of our steering committee to introduce both Maya and Chloe. Assuming Amanda's still there. Have I lost you? <laughs> Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, we're good. Hi, Amanda. All right. Okay. So, uh, hello. <laughs> I'm I'm here by telephone. That's why you can't see me. So, I just I'd like to welcome both of our speakers for this evening's presentation, and I'd just like to uh, read you a couple of their bios. So, our first presenter is Maya Navrot, and she is the Outreach and Stewardship Coordinator with Quinty Conservation, and she's worked there since 2007. She has her Bachelor of Science degree in Environmental Sciences and Biology, and Maya delivers education and outreach programming and coordinates landowner stewardship programming for Quinty Conservation. Chloe Lajoie is the Natural Edge Program Manager at Watersheds Canada. She has her BSc Honours in Environmental Biology and Technology, and she also has an Environmental Technician Protection and Compliance Diploma. She works with landowners to design and carry out shore restorations to improve and protect Canada's lakes and rivers. Welcome to you both, and thank you. At this point, Maya, I will stop sharing and you should be able to pick it up. Okay. Now, are you able to see that screen? We're good. Yes, we are. Yep. Excellent. Okay, well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, first off, I'm, I'm gonna shut my camera off, likely for some of this. I have one of those rural internet connections that uh, 
that can be a little bit unstable. So when my camera's off, it's a little bit easier to go uh, through it smoothly. Uh, so I'd first, uh, I'd love to uh, extend our thanks to the Friends of uh, Napanee, Friends of Salmon River, your board members and your volunteers and your members for all the great work that you do. And I see Stewardship, uh, Stewardship Council members uh, in the Zoom room today. And so many thanks to all of you. Uh, we've been uh, working alongside you for, uh, for many years now and boy, the, the work that you achieve on the ground really is something and we do rely so much uh, on these volunteer based uh, watershed groups and stewardship councils and lake groups to help get these messages and the information out. So even hosting these sorts of sessions uh, uh, is uh, really great. All right, so tonight, uh, Chloe and I will take you through what it takes to, uh, to have a healthy watershed and what we know about the Napanee and Salmon watershed and uh, where we want to go from here and how together we can get to that healthiest watershed that we'd all like to see. Just having some issues moving my slides. All right, so we are one of 31 conservation authorities across Ontario, and we are watershed based. So our boundaries are not set by political boundaries, but about uh, more about the elevation on the land. And uh, we undertake watershed based programs to protect people and property from flooding and other natural hazards, and also to conserve natural resources on the land. Uh, while balancing economic, social, and environmental benefits. So our Quinty Conservation Region watersheds are actually uh, three uh, main watersheds, the Moira River watershed, the Napanee Region watershed that encompasses both the Salmon watershed and the Napanee watershed, uh, as well as the Prince Edward region watershed. These were at one time three separate conservation authorities that amalgamated into one called Quinney Conservation, uh, which started in 1947. So our core programming has to do with uh, forecasting flooding as well as low water and drought response. We do own and operate uh, water control structures or dams in the river systems. We also uh, deliver the permits, planning and regulation for proposed development in floodplains and on sensitive lands. And we aid in the protection of the municipal drinking water sources through our source uh, protection. We own over 30,000 acres of, of lands. Uh, we also participate in watershed health monitoring and uh, do landowner stewardship and outreach like we're doing tonight. So that term watershed, it's, it's new to some, or maybe we've heard it and we forget what that is. Uh, a watershed is an area of land that drains to a main water system. So a watershed is very much like a funnel. So when a drop of water falls inside the watershed, it flows downhill to a main body of water. So today we're, we're mainly talking about the Napanee region watershed and, and two watersheds of Salmon and Napanee. So when the water flows down those two watersheds, the land drains down to the salmon or the land drains down to the Napanee. The water moves through those watersheds in one of two ways. One is by soaking into the ground and percolating through the soil. And as it percolates through the soil, it also gets cleaned and filtered and then it recharges groundwater and eventually reconnects to the surface water. The other way that the water moves through the watershed is directly down the land. And this is called runoff. And then this runoff flows down the land into ditches, creeks and streams, which then flow down into the main river. Here it would be salmon or Napanee. And then carrying with it, whatever it happens to pick up off the land. So the pollutants that it can carry down. And then this goes down into the lakes and eventually down into the Bay of Quinty connected here to Lake Ontario. It's 
So for this presentation, as I mentioned, we're going to focus on the two uh, watersheds here, since we've got friends of uh, Napanee and, and friends of Salmon who are hosting the event. So the Napanee River watershed is just over a thousand square kilometers, while the Salmon River watershed is just under a thousand, so they're uh, pretty close to equal in size. Just another nice image there of uh, watershed. And so thinking about everything that uh, fits into a watershed. We have our urban centers and we've got our small towns and our rural centers. We've got farms and industry and, and businesses. Uh, all sorts of things happening in a watershed. And that, what I like to remind everybody is we all live in a watershed. Everybody is a part of one and we all have a role to play in helping to keep it healthy. So we do monitor for watershed conditions and we've been collecting and analyzing data for decades. Uh, every five years or so, or as needed, we'll analyze the data we have and uh, track our progress in terms of where we're going with watershed health. And this helps us to target our efforts, funding, and to target programs to what's most needed in each region to help achieve that optimal watershed health. So we sample annually for, uh, for the uh, Benthic, so that's the Ontario Benthos Biomonitoring Network. Uh, basically, our uh, watershed monitoring staff are uh, out in set points in tributaries, kicking up the muck and catching the critters at the bottom, identifying and counting and tracking and submitting that data. And based on what critters are living there, uh, it can tell us a lot about how the water systems are changing. Uh, these macroinvertebrates are indicators of watershed health. So we're looking at not just the uh, diversity of bugs, but also uh, we're looking at the, the density of, of what's there and, and what's not there. So we do uh, provincial or surface water quality testing through the provincial water quality monitoring network. And so again, we have set sites across the watershed where we do surface water sampling uh, and the data is sent off to labs and the uh, data is all put into a system. Again, that can be analyzed and trended as we go. There's the Provincial Groundwater Monitoring Network. So you can see where we have here on the map, uh, the monitoring wells are indicated. Uh, here we can track the quality of groundwater as well as quantity. This also helps to aid in our response program. And I've also added onto this map uh, water control structures. So those are the ones that Quinney Conservation owns and may operate, not all of them are operated. There are other mills privately owned or dams uh, that were probably put there for mills in the past uh, that can be found in the river system as well. So when we do crunch the data, we do see that water conditions are considered good, uh, not excellent, but good. Uh, so that's what we would expect from these watersheds, they're, they're relatively natural, uh, especially in the headwaters, so the upper regions of the watershed. Uh, we have seen specifically in the Napanee uh, increased nutrient loading at the base of the Bay of Quinte. And so we do know that uh, we do have some uh, potential runoff and erosion concerns uh, upriver from that opening of the Napanee. Uh, into the Bay of Quinte. Now to gain a, a better understanding of our changing watershed conditions and to achieve improved overall watershed health, we need to look at how the landscape has changed over time. And so hundreds of years ago, pre-European settlement, our lands here looked very different than they do today. The land was heavily covered with dense, mature, mixed forest. And this was the traditional territory here of the Anishinaabeg, the Huron-Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee Iroquois. And so they were living here 
on the land prior to the European settlement coming in. And before they knew it, the land had changed drastically. And so very little of this original dense mature forest remains today. Because the European settlers arrived and saw these dense forests as barriers to settlement. And they saw it as a resource to build town, to build an economy. And so clearing and logging began. And lands were cleared for lumber and sold and for potash manufacturing. And on top of that, cut and burned simply to make room for development and roads and to make room for farmland. Mills and grist dams were constructed in the rivers and towns were built and expanded on up and down the rivers. A rail line came in, built in the late 1800s into the early 1900s to connect the Ottawa Valley to the Bay of Quinte. That rail line, it's now converted into a recreational trail. The land, the rivers, the forests, everything went through a fast and drastic change in just the last 150 to 200 years. And this is relatively recent. We are feeling the impact still of this drastic land use change. And this drastic change in our lands that impacted our rivers and our lakes. By the 1880s, only 20 to 30% of the original forest remained. Revenue from the harvested forest was used to build the province's infrastructure. But what followed was detrimental environmental effects. The rapid exploitation of the forest resulted in severe soil erosion, reduced water quality and siltation of the rivers and lakes, more frequent and drastic flooding due to the higher volumes of runoff that was now occurring. And also a reduction in the amount of groundwater that was available. And so when all of these impacts were felt and seen, replanting efforts began. And so marginalized farmlands, cleared lands that were never used uh, were replanted into new forests. And the province responded by establishing four provincial nurseries in southern Ontario to help get millions of trees back in the ground. The large pine and spruce plantations that you can see today, uh, the plantations on municipal properties and conservation authority properties across southern Ontario, as well as on uh, many private lands testify to those efforts that lasted well into the mid 1990s and it still continues today. Here is a pretty common scene of a uh, kind of forest that you would recognize across our region. So these plantations that were put in, um, many of them pine plantations. So these were originally put in uh, to get those trees back on the landscape to help address some of those uh, environmental impacts that were being experienced, but they were also seen as crop forests meant to be thinned over time with the wood sold to the lumber industry. And while the, the trees were growing and, and leaf matter was falling and, and it was slowly thinned, organic matter would build up on the forest floor again. And seeds from native vegetation would make their way in. And as the canopy was opened up and trees were taken out or, or uh, uh, died off and fell, then you would get this new second growth forest regeneration underneath which was bringing back those original forests on the land. So in these conifer plantations where they have been thin, naturally thinning themselves, you can see this whole new forest coming up underneath. And that's a, a, a bit of a window into the forest that did exist here, the mixed dense forest. And where Planting didn't actively happen. You can find areas in natural succession as well, field areas just slowly coming in. And this second growth natural regeneration comprises uh, much of our wetlands or woodlands, sorry. 
So there are a few things that we look at to get an understanding of watershed health and how that watershed health is changing over time. And one of those is forest cover. Environment Canada recommends a minimum of 30% forest cover. Uh, the NAP watershed currently sits at about 31% forest cover and the salmon a little higher at 43.2%. Uh, so we've, uh, we've hit the minimum, but can we do better? Sure, absolutely. And the, uh, the benefits of uh, having that forest cover on the land is a uh, reason to keep on going. And we, we are, we are putting a lot of trees in the ground uh, every year, not just us, but, uh, but our partners. Um, yeah, to bring, bring those forests back. So the forests aid in helping to reduce water runoff and soil erosion by intercepting and slowing rainfall and snowmelt, essentially acting like sponges on the landscape. And as they slow that rainfall and snowmelt, it allows that water to percolate into the ground and then recharge groundwater water, as opposed to running off into our water systems. And so you also get a, a cleaning processing process happening as it's percolating through the soil. Uh, and the more we can also drive back down into groundwater recharge, uh, the better for reducing impacts of flooding and to reduce the frequency of flooding events. And if you had uh, listened to Mark Boone's talk, uh, you'll understand too the importance of that water percolating back down into the ground to help recharge groundwater and get us through those droughts that we're experiencing more of now that we have uh, this climate change with as well. So lots of other uh, great reasons for trees on the landscape, of course, uh, supporting animal and plant life and uh, ensuring that we have healthy and, and biodiverse uh, systems here. Uh, and then the climate change connection, those trees uh, absorb and sequester excess carbon in the atmosphere and it can help to address climate change issues down the road. There's just a, a more recent picture uh, of uh, that runoff that I'm talking about coming off uh, this and this one happens to be off an agricultural field into a ditch that then flows down into a local river. You can see uh, all this, the soil and, and likely fertilizer and all sorts of other things that it's carrying with it. So there's just a, a quick little map that uh, we created here this week uh, showing forest cover patches across, again, just the, the salmon and Napanee watersheds. So forest interior, this is a Another uh, gauge that we look at for watershed health. This gives us an idea of how big these patches of forest are. Environment Canada recommends a minimum of 10% interior forest cover. And Napanee currently sits at 5.7% and the Salmon River watershed at 10.1%. This is pretty typical of our southern Ontario landscape. It's very fragmented and developed. We also have a heavy agricultural uh, community here across the region. And so you're not going to find uh, as many large patches of forest. So how we figure out this number, we take those portions of forest and remove a hundred meter buffer from inside the perimeter of a woodlot and then take what's left. And so the significance of this is that these larger pockets of forest are least susceptible to disturbance and things like invasive species. And so they're therefore of higher habitat value and higher ecological value. And there's that very fragmented landscape that I just mentioned. If you just uh, open up Google Earth tonight and take a look at where you fit into the landscape, you're going to see 
this fragmentation, these pockets or patches of forest, it's hard to find large sections or patches of this anymore. So it's a little harder to find that interior forest we're looking for. So we're always uh, encouraging landowners and when we're doing our programming, we're, we're looking at how we can uh, reconnect some of these patches, uh, whether it's planting an, an entire area to, to make a larger forest patch in the near future or simply connecting patches through what we call wildlife corridors. So even these, these shelter belts or wind rows between uh, forest patches, this allows uh, wildlife to move between patches with, uh, with less stress of doing so. So there's just a, a map showing the interior forest. So again, those larger, more significant patches of forest. We hope that that will change uh, in time as we continue to roll out stewardship programs and work with landowners uh, to, to be able to uh, live on these lands and recreate and farm, but also apply some of these uh, practices to help uh, improve the landscape and, and uh, create more um, healthy and resilient forests and wetlands and, uh, and watersheds. So some of those programs that we do have for landowners, so not just us, but our partners, uh, if you're looking to do some large scale tree planting, I encourage you to look at the 50 million tree program. So this is through Forest Ontario. It's a heavily subsidized full service program. Uh, this program plants across our Quinney watershed well over 100,000 trees a year. So if you're looking to plant several acres or more, this is a great one to apply to. There is a, a landowner cost for the program that can vary, but typically for our region, it's somewhere around uh, 40 to 50 cents per tree, and that is entirely done for you. Uh, species are selected, the plant is created, the stock is acquired, and it's physically machine planted for you. So another program that uh, we have uh, in response to what we know about our watersheds and that heavy agricultural land use that we see across our region are the agricultural buffer planting programs. And so this is a full service tree and shrub planting program within a 30 meter of a uh, water system uh, along um, agricultural fields. And here's a picture actually of uh, Watersheds Canada staff uh, we planted in 2020 in the in the spring uh, in the Napanee watershed on uh, a 30 meter buffer uh, on a water course that did drain into the Napanee River. So in case Ken is listening tonight or watching it on YouTube, thank you Ken for your uh, contribution in, in helping to protect the Napanee River. Uh, now, if you're looking to do smaller scale plantings, or you're looking at how your property can contribute to overall watershed health, but you're not looking to plant several acres of trees, reach out. Uh, we'd be happy to provide advice and, and hopefully connect you with some programs that are out there. The uh, Rural Stewardship Program is delivered by Bay of Quinty Remedial Action Plan, which is a program of Quinty Conservation and Lower Trent Conservation. And it's all about cleaning up and protecting the Bay of Quinty. There are cost sharing incentive programs uh, for landowners south of Seven to the Bay of Quinty that uh, will help cover costs for livestock fencing from water systems, uh, funding for erosion and water quality improvement projects, waterway planting funding, cover crop funding and soil testing funding. So if you're interested in, in more information about that, you're welcome to contact me uh, through the Quinney Conservation website or my email will be at the end. You can also reach out directly to Bay of Quinty Remedial Action Plan. 
And so I did just talk a lot about trees and I felt like I needed to put this in because this is the Napanee region. Uh, and uh, Friends of Napanee and Friends of Salmon have been involved in this initiative, the Napanee Plains Joint Initiative, uh, where we're uh, hoping to uh, educate landowners on recognizing this sensitive alvar and grassland environment that they may have on their properties. And so alvar is a unique and a, and a bit of a rare system. It occurs when you have uh, very flat areas and thin soil over bedrock. They're naturally open and they have little to no tree cover. And they're very subject to both flooding and drought. So you get a very unique uh, kind of species there. There are also sites that are uh, very sensitive to disturbance. So if you could recognize that you have alvar on your property, uh, you can uh, hopefully uh, recognize it for what it is and um, understand that it is sensitive and, and uh, you know, uh, protect it. And uh, there are some uh, pretty unique species that you may be able to find there. So there is more information through napaneeplain.org. You can also get to that website through the Quinney Conservation website. And this Napanee Plain Joint Initiative, we created a great little handbook for landowners to help you recognize if you have this alvar on your property. And if you do happen to sit within that map of the Na Napanee Limestone Plain area, uh, there's a higher chance that you do have alvar on your property. And so when it comes to alvar, you're not going to want to try to plant that. One, it's going to be really hard to plant. Two, we want to protect the alvar we do have. So another indicator of watershed health is wetland cover. And so Environment Canada recommends a minimum of a 10% wetland cover. The Napanee River watershed 13.84, Salmon River 13.44. So we're just above the uh, minimum recommended. Wetlands are extremely important on the landscape. Uh, there was a time where they were seen as, as wastelands uh, and they were filled in, again to uh, create more farmland and for um, for uh, opening up for development. These wetlands are like the kidneys of the watershed. They hold and retain water and they filter and clean it when they provide essential habitat for so many plants and animals. And so these wetlands can help slow the impacts of flooding and help us get through times of drought when they uh, slowly release water back into uh, the ground. So where we can, uh, we now do protect wetland uh, and where we can bring them back and recreate wetlands, uh, let's consider it. And so if you think that you may have a suitable spot for wetland recreation, then uh, reaching out to Ducks Unlimited would be uh, a good first step. Uh, they've got some uh, great resources and they can provide advice and uh, they can have funding to support recreation of ponds as well. So there's just a map showing the wetland cover across the region. And if you live in an urban environment, uh, you might not be able to put a, a pond on your property, but you sure can consider a rain garden option. And so uh, Olivia Hughes from our office, she's with Quinney Conservation, the Stormwater Project Coordinator, will be speaking about this on May 18th, uh, specifically green infrastructure, uh, with more information on creating a rain garden. And a rain garden is, is uh, essentially diverting the runoff from your roof and driveway away from the storm sewer system. I, that drains directly into the here, this uh, the Bay of Quinty, uh, into a rain garden, which is really just a shallow depression in your yard, and your water diverts to it. Again, your your plants use up the use the water. The water percolates back into the ground, uh, and all around we've got habitat created in the, in the yard. We have less water 
uh, washing down into our water systems. Uh, and yeah, so it's just a really great option if you live in urban areas, there is uh, grant money available to you. So up to $500 can go back into urban rain garden projects. And you would apply through BQ RAP again. So this brings us to the riparian zone. The riparian is another indicator of watershed health, and that's the 30 meter wide zone on both sides of any open water course. And so having that 30 meter zone as forested is so important in helping to maintain water temperatures, to maintain the bank stability and to slow erosion. Uh, it's also important in filtering excess nutrients. And so Environment Canada recommends 50% forested riparian. Here in that Napanee River watershed, we're looking at a 29.3% forested riparian. And for the salmon, 35.2. So this has also been an area that we have focused on, uh, trying to improve that. And uh, a few years back, we um, created this uh, partnership. We seeked it with Watersheds Canada so that we could bring their full service natural edge program to our region. Uh, we had heard quite consistently from landowners that they felt that they were lacking the the knowledge and comfort level and, and in some cases even the physical ability to, to replant their shorelines. So even just having a landowner grant uh, wasn't enough. And so we were very fortunate to be able to partner with Watersheds Canada to bring their natural edge program here. And so this is where I'd like to pass it off to Chloe where she can talk all about shoreline planting in that riparian area. And just before I do that, oh, sorry, there's our forested riparian map. We can see we're really lacking in the southern regions where it's, uh, where it's more developed. But just before I pass it off to Chloe, uh, I'd just like to encourage anybody to reach out to us if you have ideas or suggestions of programming that we can offer, funding that we can leverage to help landowners implement projects on the landscape to help improve overall watershed health. And we truly do appreciate our partnerships with the Friends of Groups and the Stewardship Councils. Uh, and we really do want to keep hearing your ideas and together we can just keep on moving ahead and uh, making some pretty important strides to uh, improving, improving our region here all around. So Chloe, I'm going to pass it off to you now. Thanks. All right, thanks, Maya. Let's share my screen. Can you guys see that? Good. Yep. That's fine. There we go. All right. So thank you guys so much for having me out or speak not out, but speaking to you guys. Um, it's always great to engage with new groups and and share our program uh, to new regions. So we'll just start off with um, who Watersheds Canada is, because I'm not sure if many of you have um, been in contact with us before or have really heard about us. So we are a nonprofit and charity based out of Perth. We started in 2002 and we work with landowners, communities and other organizations to protect Canada's freshwater. Basically what we do is we develop different stewardship programs, test and pilot them here in Eastern Ontario, and then we share them with other groups all across Canada. Um, we have a few different programs, but one of our largest is the Natural Edge, and that's what we'll be just uh, talking about tonight. So our Natural Edge program is a shoreline restoration program, and 
It's where we work with landowners to restore their shoreline and bring it back to a natural state. And we do this by planting a selection of native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers that are all native and suitable for their property. Uh, like Maya said, we focus on the riparian area. So that's, again, the 30 meters set back from the shoreline. So any planting in there would be uh, riparian restoration. And that's where we focus the majority of our plantings. So we'll start off with a completely natural shoreline. So you can see what it looks like. There's different levels of vegetation. There's tree cover, shrubs ground covers, you can even see there's aquatic vegetation um, in the right hand corner there. And it's really every all of these plants work together to contribute to healthy lakes and rivers and really protect our, our fresh water. I have this video that I'd like to show you. Um, and this is just an underwater look at a, at a natural and healthy shoreline. So you can see how clean and clear the water is lots of aquatic vegetation. You can see all the fish swimming around. It's great habitat for them. And this is basically a look at, this is what we want all our water to look like. Um, but again, what we're seeing nowadays is in, an increase in developed shorelines. So there's a lot of cottage to home conversion happening, a lot of waterfront property development. Um, and especially with this pandemic, we're finding a lot of people are moving out to these um, rural areas and, and moving out to be more in nature, but um, com what comes with development is again, clearing these shorelines and removing any vegetation. So it's typically you would see manicured lawn all the way to the water's edge, very few trees, if any, and a lot of times to correct any issues, you'll see either concrete retaining walls or some sort of hardened shoreline rather than a natural one. So compared to that first video I showed you, this is an underwater look at a developed shoreline or a disturbed shoreline. So again, grass to the water's edge and you can just see how murky and, um, and, and unclear that this water is. There really isn't any shoreline or aquatic vegetation. Um, typically that gets removed for the swimming area, um, but it's really beneficial to leave. And we didn't even see any fish in this, in this little clip. Um, so there is quite a difference that you can see just at the underwater level between um, a natural shoreline and a developed shoreline. So now that you see what the two shorelines look like, um, I'd just like to go over the many benefits that a vegetative buffer provides. And Maya touched on a few of, on a few of them. So first of all, it's a great habitat um, for both terrestrial and aquatic wildlife. Um, aquatic wildlife especially uses this riparian area over 90, or at some point in their lifetime, um, whether it's for shelter, providing food or breeding areas. Um, it, it's, it's a really important and vital habitat for them. Not only is it the actual plants on land habitat for like um, small mammals and birds, but as plants grow like trees and shrubs grow out and overhang onto the, into the very shallow waters or the, um, right along the edge, that creates a great habitat for fish, frogs, turtles, things like that. Um, plants are also very important in holding our shorelines in place and stabilizing soil. Uh, like Maya was talking about, plants are great for securing soil. And in the past few years, we've seen such an increase in erosion, especially with these um, big floods that have occurred in our areas. So you can see in the picture, when, um, when there's a property with a manicured lawn, those grass roots are very, very short. So they can't grow down and hold on to the soil. Whereas if you have different levels with like trees and shrubs, wildflowers, there's all these different types of root systems working together, growing very deep into the soil and kind of weaving around and holding the soil in like a basket. 
Um, so it's, it's really effective at um, stopping erosion from happening. So not only do the ro roots hold the soil in place, but as plants and shrubs grow and overhang into the water, and if you have the aquatic vegetation in place, any waves and boat wakes that come in, their impact is broken up. So it's not hitting as hard against the shoreline. When these waves and boat wakes come in and there aren't these plants there and they, there aren't the root systems there to hold the soil, then really the soil is just hit and it starts to break up. And once there's even like a little crack in there, water gets in quite easily and really just starts to pull that soil out into the water. Um, and once that soil is gone, uh, it's gone, you can't get it back. Um, again, with the different levels of the vegetation, so the trees, the shrubs, the ground covers, it's really effective at um, breaking up heavy rainfalls as well. In some cases, when it's just a lawn, if we have a really heavy rainfall or a storm and those droplets hit really hard, that can cause erosion. If there's these different levels, then those water droplets are hitting, say, the the tree cover, then the shrubs, then the ground cover. And it's really um, reducing that impact and slowing the water droplets. And again, um, reducing erosion from happening. Plants are also great for um, improving our water quality. So plants work to um, filter out excess nutrients and toxins out of our water runoff before entering the, either the lake or river, whatever's next to it. Um, and what happens when there's excess nutrients is we see an increase in these algae blooms and in some cases, toxic algae blooms. And this can cause like a fish die off because oxygen is getting depleted when it's used to, um, to grow this algae. Um, but I, I really like this photo because this looks like a natural shoreline, but there's a big algae bloom right next to it. So the rest of this lake is actually really highly developed. And so like Maya was saying, everybody has their role to play. Everybody on this lake has their role to play and what they're doing in one section of the lake is negatively affecting the, uh, another, like a different section um, down at the other end of the lake. So I, I just, I really like this photo so you can see that everybody's action affects everybody else's. Also, if you have a problem with geese, um, plants are really great to deter them. So a lot of times you'll find geese will just swim by and come up on your property if you have a lawn or a beach. And this is because when they're swimming by, they like a wide open area. If you have trees or shrubs there, they're less likely to come on land because they, they're not sure if there's a predator lurking behind it. Um, and I've seen this at properties when I'm out on them is if I'm, I was on a more natural shoreline and there are about 20 to 30 geese swimming by and they went right by the one the property I was on and then entered on the nice sandy beach next door and, and hung out there for a bit so if you do have an issue with geese this is a way that you can deter them. Uh, plants are also great to regulate water temperatures so water temperatures are increasing and this is because trees and shrubs and native vegetation are removed from the shoreline. So they're not shading that very, um, uh, the very shallow waters right along the edge. As well, if you have, say, a hardened shoreline, like a concrete retaining wall, well, in the summer, everyone knows what it's like to walk on pavement and how hot it gets. So imagine if the sun's heating up this concrete retaining wall, it's transferring that heat then to the cool water. So it's um, contributing to the, the rise in water temperatures, which can have a negative effect on fish populations and the reproduction rates. So if you can, plant behind uh, these concrete retaining walls to shade it out. So overall working together, what is this doing? But it's protecting your property value, which is a big thing. Um, is protecting your shoreline from erosion, so keeping everything intact. You don't want to lose your land or else it's just gone. Um, and it also protects water quality because people are buying and moving to these areas because they want to go swimming and fishing and boating. And everyone wants to do that on a, on a, cleaner, a cleaner, healthier lake. 
Also plants are great for, for creating more privacy um, from your neighbors and also blocking noise um, off of the water. All right, so now you know the benefits, but what can you do to protect your shoreline? So what we've been talking about this whole time is planting native trees and shrubs and wildflowers. And you can do this on your own. Um, the first thing you're going to want to do is choose where you want to plant. So I like to use the 25% rule, where that's 25% of your shoreline you'll keep for yourself and the remaining 75% you'll give back to nature. And that's where you'll do the planting. So in this 25%, that includes your water access points. So where you enter to go swimming, where you would put a canoe in or where you would access your dock. Um, some people even use it at, for their little seating area. Um, so you'll really wanna think through for now and pretend, like in the future, if you decide you wanna, um, you want to make this decision so that you allow the plants to grow and then this will be your entrance to the water. And uh, you'll also want to keep in mind your sight lines. Everyone moves to the water for that view and we don't want to take it away. So that's where you can get into choosing different species with different heights. I really like to put taller plants on the outside of, or on the edges of the property and you can go with shorter plants more in the middle. Also, if you want a tree, you can use a deciduous tree rather than a conifer so that when they're, when they're grown, you just have to look around a trunk. Next thing you'll want to do is determine your site conditions. So what type of soil, what's the moisture level, how much sunlight availability is there? And knowing this will help you to, deter to choose which native plants would be best. So you can even do this just with a shovel, dig down um, and grab a handful of soil. If it's more gritty, then you have more sand in it. If it's stickier, there'll be clay. Somewhere in between would be a loam. Um, lots of information online if you just want to look up. There are many little tests you can do to help you uh, determine what type of soil you have. And most native plants um, tolerate a range of, of soil conditions. So um, it, it, it'll be fairly easy to find plants suitable for your site. Um, also keep in mind how wet or how dry your shoreline is. Do you suffer from, uh, from spring flooding? Do you, um, is it drier? Do you experience more droughts? Or if it's a cottage property and you're not there all the time to water them, you'll want to use a more drought tolerant plant in that case. So one way we can help is we have our native plant database available on our website. Um, and this is where you would enter in your site conditions. Um, and first it starts off with a hardiness zone. So hardiness zone is based on your location. So it takes into account climate. Um, and for you guys, I mean, the Quinty watershed ranges from zone 5A up on the Northern end and then all the way down to 7A down in Prince Edward County for the um, Napanee River, you would be in zones 5B and 6A based on your location. And then for the um, Salmon River, there'd be a bigger range. You're going to be up around that 5A and we'll go all the way down to 6A. Um, so yeah, you'd have to find that out. I will warn you though that our database is undergoing maintenance right now. Um, so the zone map doesn't work but you can go in and just search for plants still. So here's just a few examples of native trees and shrubs. Um, you can also go in using the database and choose like the preferred height. So for a low shrub, I really like to use say sweet gale in a wet area. Um, sweet gale really loves to have its roots wet. So it will actually grow out over the water rather than up. So really great uh, plant to use for higher shrubs. There's a lot of different fruiting and flowering species out there like dogwoods, service berry, things like that. Um, and then always great to include a couple trees to help create that shade over the shoreline and shade for yourself. So what do you do if you have a retaining wall? Um, 
it's a great, and I highly suggest to just plant right behind it now. Retaining walls are a very quick fix to erosion, but they don't last forever. Um, so over time, and I see this, and I'm called out to a lot of properties where the retaining wall is starting to fail um, and break apart and fall into the water. So I always suggest to get a plant, plant started behind it right away, um, because of course, plants are the long-term solution. It takes a while for them to um, establish both their root system and start growing and start to spread. So get those plants started right away. Um, and that again will help to shade that retaining wall, help to protect uh, water quality or water temperatures and just soften the shoreline. If you have riprap, and in some cases, um, shorelines, the erosion is so severe that plants aren't going to fix it right away. Um, so you'll wanna do like a combination where you will put install riprap, but you'll actually plant within it. So sorry, these aren't the best quality photos, but um, basically when the riprap is installed, if you just remove a few of those rocks um, and plant either like a taller, um, like a potted stalk or, or bare root works as well, but you would go in and actually plant within it so that those plants and those roots are starting to grow within the riprap. Um, not only does do the plants help to hold the soil, but they also work to hold the, uh, the rocks in place. Over time with waves and boat wakes, the rocks will actually shift a bit and, and could start to fall. So plants help to secure those as well. Planting native wildflowers is great. Um, always great to mix those in for our pollinator species. And there's lots of different native, uh, native wildflowers for you to choose from. Um, asters are great if you want that pop of color in the fall. Uh, Black-eyed Susans are great throughout the summer. And there's different types of milkweed. So butterfly milkweed is for a drier area. Um, there's swamp milkweed or common milkweed. And these are really great for our monarch butterfly population. So I always like to include some version of a milkweed um, for them. And now if, if you have a fallen tree or anything that's fallen in along the shoreline, if it's safe to leave, um, it's best to leave it. This is really great habitat. Um, turtles love to come in and bask on these logs. It's great for frogs and for fish swimming around. It's like great habitat for them. So if you can leave it, I highly suggest to do it. They're also great for breaking up those wave impacts and protecting your shoreline from erosion. And then aquatic vegetation. Everybody loves to remove it, but as you can see in those videos, it really does play a key role. Um, so if you can, and what we suggest is if it's for your swimming area, just clear a single pathway so that you can get out to deeper water um, and, ju and just swim out in the deeper water so that the vegetation is still in place for, uh, for wildlife and to help with slowing waves and boat wakes coming in, but you still have your access to get out to, to, to go swimming. Getting to the lake, depending on your property, um, you might need stairs. It's best to install stairs like on the right where they're elevated and there's only a few contact points with the ground. And you'll also want to leave the backs open so that when it rains, the water just can hit the stairs and kind of flow out the back um, so it's not building up. Whereas if you have like built-in or embedded stairs like on the left, when it rains, water hits it and starts flowing off to the side. And that's when you have a lot of erosion occurring right along the edges. Um, again, with, the, with elevated stairs, you can even have like shade tolerant plants growing underneath. So um, they really are the best option when you can put those in. If you don't need stairs and you just have a pathway to get down to the water, it's always best to create like an S curve um, instead of just a straight shot or a straight pathway down. This really helps with um, during a rainfall and you have heavy water or water runoff or rain runoff. This slows it down because it doesn't have a, a straight shot. 
Um, it has to curve and go with the pathway, slowing it to, to the edge. Also great for keeping one pathway so that uh, you're not walking all over the place and it allows for new, new plants and new vegetation to, to grow. It gives them a chance. So that's what you can do on your own, but I know it can be a bit daunting not knowing what to plant um, or, or just kind of need that help to get started. So that's where our, our natural edge program comes in and that's where we work with you to, to restore your, your shoreline and your property. We currently have two different projects funded within the Quinty Watershed. So the first one, is a three-year project and we're actually in our final year of that. So it will be wrapping it up um, in November, December. And it was a three-year project that was funded by the Ontario Trilling Foundation. And our target was to plant 23,700 native plants um, and re restore a total, like, a total of three kilometers of shoreline. We've already done uh, 11,000, almost 12,000 plants in the first two years. Obviously with COVID, we had to push more into this year. We couldn't, uh, couldn't reach our year two targets. So we have, I think 11,900 to plant this year, which we have two agricultural sites lined up, um, three demonstration sites and around 50 to 60 private properties um, that we'll be working on in the, in the spring and in the fall. But if you'd like to sign up for it, we can hopefully like squeeze a few more people in if you're interested. Um, and so how it works is we start with a site visit. So this is a free site visit that will come out, meet with you and just walk your shoreline. We really like to do this because it's great for you to tell us what you're seeing, any issues that you have and also what your goals for your shoreline or what you're looking to get out of this program and what you're wanting to do in the future. Um, and it's also great because this gives us a chance to walk it with you and point out any areas of concern. So while we're there, we'll take photos, measurements and a soil sample. Um, and then we'll create a planting plan. So this is like a restoration plan specific for your property. And we'll be actually do this on site with you. We've created and developed our own natural edge app. So we bring this app out with us. We use it to take the photos and then we overlay it just using shapes um, where we will be planting and what species are chosen. So our native plant database that I spoke about is actually integrated into our app. And so we enter in your site conditions and it spits out what native plants are best suited for your property. And then we'll go through it together and you can say what you like, what you don't like, and you can help with the placement as well to make sure that your pathways are left open how you'd like it um, and, and species and certain heights are where you want them. So once we've created that, we would send you a PDF um, and then it requires your approval. So there's a landowner stewardship agreement that you would sign. And it basically just states that you'll provide reasonable reasonable care for your new plants and that you won't remove them. So once you've signed off and you're happy with the plan, then that brings us to planting. This is where our two different projects uh, differ. So for that first pr project that I was talking about, about the that was funded through Ontario Trillium Foundation. For this project, we provide everything where we will order the plants and materials and actually bring it out to you and do the planting for you. This is at a cost of like a 25% landowner contribution. Our funding from Trillium covers the other 75%. And so we ask landowners con to contribute the rest. This does vary based on the size of your property. It can range anywhere from, I'd say five to $800 is what we've been seeing so far. And then option two is our natural edge starter kits. So these are really great for smaller properties. Um, that are around 50 plants uh, and for the in this case you would actually pick up your natural edge starter kit it comes with the plants and everything and you would plant your shoreline yourself rather than having us do it and maya is the one delivering these natural edge starter kits so she would be the one coming out for your site visit 
um, creating your plans and she uses our app as well. So it's the same process, but instead of us, instead of us coming out and doing the planting for you, instead you would get 50 native plants. So that's 35 bare root plants, 10 potted plants and five wildflowers. You also get like the coconut fiber pads, which is just another form of mulch. And those go around the bare root and potted plants. And then there's mulch for the wildflowers. If you have any deciduous trees, then you would get the tree guards for that as well. Um, so yeah, if you, if you have a smaller property or if you're more interested in the kits and doing it yourself, uh, please reach out to Maya, reach out to my, myself also, and I can uh, hand you over to her and she'll come out and do, uh, do your site visit, create your plan and get your kits ordered and ready for you to pick them up. So for both projects, you would get your planting plan. So this is just a screenshot of the planting compartments. So when we take the photos at your site, this is what it will look like where we'll show you the outline. And in this case, it's seven potted pussy willow and four potted button bush that will get planted. In the next compartment, there are four red osier dogwood bare root plants. Um, so that's how you can just tell the difference is the potted is a circle, bare root is more of a shape. Um, and based on the size of your property, you can have one, two, up to 10 or however many planting compartments, it, it all depends. And so it just lays it out. Um, as well in the planting plan, there is say the, uh, the plant table, like a, a description table. So it comes with a description and a picture of each plant chosen, these compartments, the financial breakdown and that stewardship agreement as well. So here's just a few photos. This was actually a demonstration site we did back in 2016. As you can see on the bottom, this was before, and it was just grass right to the river. Um, they were experiencing a lot of erosion, a lot of geese coming up on land and suffered from flooding as well. So we got some funding um, through a different project and came in and we planted about 800 plants on this, uh, on this property. And then this is one we visited in 2019, so three years later. And I really like this top photo here because we did plant wildflowers, but this wasn't our wildflower section. So just by leaving it these and letting nature take its course, so the plants that we planted started to fill in, but it also allowed for new plants to come in and seed themselves and spread. Uh, we create no mow zone. So what these landowners did is they mowed the grass up to where the new planting started and then they've left where we planted as a no mow zone. So it really just lets new stuff to come in and grow. So all of those wildflowers just appeared there after a few years. Here's just a few more examples. You can see on the bottom they had riprap. It was probably already, or already existing so they just planted above it, which is great to do as well. Um, and then this other photo here, you can see how even though it's just a creek, one neighbor decided to plant it, one neighbor didn't. And you can see how it's already starting to erode in that curve there. Um, so yeah, I, I really like that photo. And then finally, these were two properties that we did back in 2013, 2014, I believe. And they're two different approaches. So. Um, on the top, we have a landowner where we came in and we did the planting, but he really likes that more manicured lawn landscaped look. So he took it upon himself to put in that rock border. Um, and he also put mulch the plants year after year so that it was just, uh, just the plant, the shrubs and trees that we had put in that were really starting to grow and spread versus on the bottom, once it was planted, the landowner just let it go, um, didn't add any more mulch or anything. And so it's just been coming up on his own and he just mows this little, little area for his seating. So that's his like 25%, his water access and his seating area. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions or wanna sign up for a site visit, please get in touch. Uh, best to reach us through our Natural Edge email. So naturaledge at watersheds.ca.
Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. I'll hand off to uh, Nancy, is, assuming she's still there. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Oh, no, I must have uh, put something in by mistake here. I really had nothing to add. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks, ladies. I uh, really appreciate it. I, I, uh, I'm always amazed uh, listening to Maya and Chloe. Uh, every time they speak, I, I learn something or a lot yeah. more than I knew before. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of nice. Um, Thank you, Lord, for taking over. I had a glitch in my system. No problem. Can you hear me now? We're good. <laughs> okay. So um, yes, I wanted to thank. Maya and Chloe both for a wonderful presentation. Uh, the two of you worked so well together and it was so uplifting. First of all, hearing about the history of the um, Conservation Authority and the reason for it and how it has developed over the last over 100 years. The value of forests and the importance of wetlands to the watershed. So everything's all together and it was so well. I think we lost her. Um, I'm gonna ask Susan Moore, president of Friends of Salmon River and also with the Lennis and Atkins Stewardship Council to jump in just for a minute, if you wouldn't mind, Susan. I think you're muted. There. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, Susan Moore here, yeah, from the um, Lennox and Nannington Stewardship Council. And I just wanted to add the fact that we have on our website um, a little section all about planting trees. Um, and if you wanna to go to our website, it's simply lastewardship.ca in the news section. And you'll find a, um, a little, um, treatise there on um, a first section of sort of why good why plant trees good reasons for planting and then a section of programs which will include the 50 million tree program also the managed forest tax incentive program if you have a large forested property and want to save money on your taxes and also the natural edge program which Chloe described and then there's a section on um, partners that you could also um, contact uh, which include um, tree nurseries or other partners like the um, like the um, conservation authorities that can help you if you're wanting to plant trees. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Susan. So, see if I can get this to go. Here's a reminder of our, our next uh, three and last, sorry, our last three, I guess, sessions, April 20th, May 18th, and June 8th. You can find them on either Friends of the Napanee River or Friends of the Salmon River websites, and you can register there. If you're already on our mailing list, we will send out uh, a notice uh, well in advance of each of those sessions with the registration link, as well as links to all of our previous sessions. So uh, I think that should do it. I think, um, again, many thanks to everyone. Uh, before we lose everyone, I'll, if you want to ask a question, just put it in the, in the chat box and uh, we can, uh, I'll hand them off to uh, Chloe and, uh, and Maya. But again, thanks ever so much for coming out this evening. So any questions, I'll give it a few. I, I noticed there's a, a few comments here, the tw 24th of April uh, watershed cleanup. I think that's getting lots of communication across uh, all the municipalities in our area. Uh, from Elizabeth for, um, I guess it could be either Chloe or Maya, what about shorelines next to a marsh? We've done, we can do um, plantings next to a marsh. Um, it has to be more of like a, like a tributary. So um, if it's positively impacting tributaries, then yes, we do that. It might be better for a kit um, rather than a full planting as our 
ours is more geared towards the lakefront, riverfront type things. Um, other than like our large agricultural sites, usually those are on tributaries as well. All right, thanks. I'm trying to, T Tim, you've got a question here about, uh, oh, you lost many shrubs last fall, the beavers. What, <laughs> what to do about the beavers? Any suggestions from Maya? Yeah. I'm uh, I'm trying to see these. Oh, now I see them. Okay, I see the comments now. Yeah, so we get the uh, we get the calls about beavers a lot. My suggestion is that you do what you can to protect your um, your trees with like a layered chicken wire wrapped around the trunk that can help deter them. And I don't mean just one. Wrap it several times around the trunk of the tree. Uh, shrubs, funny you say lost many shrubs. I often recommend to landowners that they put shrubs in place there because the beavers will munch away on the shrubs, but they will continue to flourish up from the base and, and often uh, thicker and prettier than they were before. Uh, beavers are a tough one because if they, they like your site, uh, they are likely to stay there and continue coming back. So the, um, I'd be happy to send you some information on uh, living with beavers that just gives you some suggestions on how to live alongside them. I don't know if I have your uh, pronounce your name properly, but it looks like El Sabe, and you talk about the rotary uh, rotary watershed cleanup. And I'm wondering if you could tell us where we get more information. Either type it in the box or unmute yourself. Any other questions from anyone else? Um, Lawrence, I'm, yes. I noticed two in the chat box and I'm just not sure if they, I don't think they got addressed. There's one from Mary saying, do you also help municipalities as well as homeowners? I think this is to Chloe. Yep. Uh, yes, we have worked with municipalities. That's typically where we do our demonstration sites. So on public lands at like parks and we, also like to bring volunteers out to help do those plantings, kind of post like planting workshops. So yes, we, we do work on municipal um, properties, but obviously we have to get signed off by the municipality. Um, yeah. And Maya does a lot of work with them as well. Yeah, just to add to that, we have 18 partner municipalities that sit on our board and we work with all those municipalities, not just on uh, shoreline, uh, restoration, but also tree planting on municipal properties, so even off of the shorelines. Can, can you comment, ladies, on uh, Maura's question? Uh, she sent out to everyone about being on the Salmon River, uh, which is a big flood region and many droughts. I think well, there have been many droughts across the region, as Mark Boone pointed out in his drought presentation last time. Um, but um, any comments on plants that might be good for that type of area? that are both, sorry, was it flooding and droughts? Or? Yeah, I guess, yeah, basically flood, flood and, uh, flood, sorry, so, yeah, susceptible to floods and droughts. Um, for trees like a silver maple or a red maple would, uh, would do well. Red osier dogwood can be pretty tolerable. Fragrant sumac does really well in droughts and it can also withstand some flooding. Um, Black chokeberry is also a very hardy shrub that I use quite often. Uh, not only is it toler uh, tolerant to both flooding and drought, but even um, full sun versus I've seen it grow in very shady areas as well. So I highly suggest black to try black chokeberry. Thanks a lot. 